I'm, I'm very much not an expert in the extracellular matrix, uh, but I know it's a really big deal, and it has been kind of a peeve of mine over the last five years or so to see so little attention on it. I go to so many conferences, a bunch of conferences. I look at talks. Um, almost always people are in there talking about the insides of cells, and then they model that. Oh, look at that. So easy. Um, all right, so I'm Joe, and I am going to try to convince you that the extracellular mat matrix matters, um, and it's really complicated, and it's, it's hard, so you have to work on it. Um, it matters to aging, and it seems like there's some therapies that could possibly be employed. Um, there are a bunch of lenses that people use to look at biology, depending on how you were trained or what you fell in love with at a particular stage of your career, or something like that. Um, Immunology is, is a really weird one uh, because it seems like just a tiny branch of biology, but um, if you think about how many immune cells and how powerful they are, there's one like, in like, if you point in any direction in a tissue, like within three cells, you're gonna hit one pretty much. It's like, it's a, like a whole other way of looking at biology and aging is kind of like that. Every single cell ages, you can just think about aging for all of your, all of your biology study. But, what occurred to me is matrix biology is kind of like that. Every single cell has its matrix, too. There's like all this stuff around cells, and so I think we need to pay more attention to it. Um, but yeah, this is how people, like the typical hyper-simplified way that people think about the insides of cells mostly, and then if you go out, it's because you're doing some signaling out there occasionally. Um, and um, But really out there, it's kind of crazy, and there's all kinds of stuff going on and um, it's complicated. There's just, just the collagen, there's 28 different types and there's all these elastins and proteoglycans and glycoproteins and there's even ceramics and weird stuff. Um, one of my favorite artists, David Goodsell, uh, has a nice description here where you can see uh, the, uh, here, here's the cell membrane and then over there, uh, is a collagen fiber, and then there's all these elastins and proteoglycans and stuff like that. And this is like, as we all learned like a few years ago, there's actually no empty space in biology anywhere. Even the blood, you think, oh, there's all this water and then these cells flowing through, but it's all just kind of pretty packed. There's, um, so, it's a complex 3D meshwork of highly cross-linked proteins, carbohydrates, and ceramics, and nearly every cell type has one. Um, and it's crucial for all kinds of really important things that happen in bodies, like proliferation, adhesion, migration, polarity, like how the, the cells are oriented, differentiation, senescence, apoptosis, um, and a bunch of uh, things that specifically relate to aging in particular, which I'll be showing you soon. So here's like typical kinds of most, the most major signaling types of things um, in cells, and you'll notice that like, one of the big ones is how cells relate to their extracellular matrix, um, and then you can follow these. This is just a tiny subset of all the regulation. There's like 1,023 genes involved in mammalian extracellular matrices. Um, so don't be fooled, um, but you can, you, know, you can follow one of these around and like, yep, so the wrong thing happens to your extracellular matrix, boom, apoptosis, your cell dies. Um, and uh, the extracellular ma matrix is attached mechanically to a cell, and then inside cells, people often forget, because they imagine them as these bags of water, there are all of these complex structural fibers that go from the cell membrane to the nucleus um, and all over the place in other ways. And every time the, you, you move or squeeze or, or uh, uh, jerk on one of, see, this is, these are like actin, filaments and the green things are microtubules. Um, none of the extracellular matrix is shown in this picture, but you push on the outside of the cell and all of these filaments and fibers and move everything else inside the cell, including the nucleus, and change all kinds of stuff. Um, it's scary how complicated it is. And there's even lots of journals specifically devoted to the extracellular matrix. I'm just this is, this is me like looking at this from an outsider, and if you're already like Aaron, who I think has been looking at this, um, and Mr. English, where are you, Brad? Um, Brad, who's like falling, falling deep in love uh, right now, then this is 
all old hat to you, but like, I'm just like, wow, there's this whole world out there outside the cell. Um, uh, so as far as aging, the extracellular matrix gets messed up in lots of different ways. It gets fragmented, like broken up in pieces, glycated. Uh, and these, these slides are like on the file server, so you can take as many of photos as you want later, um, or whatever you want. But um, we've heard about these AGEs, advanced glycation end products. Um, they're kind of well known in the aging space. Um, that happens to them. There's a lot of different glycation end products, some of them with weird names. Um, Cross-linking, which makes them stiffer, accumulation of protein aggregation, um, which is famous in the neurodegeneration space. Um, they're all bad. Uh, so here's sort of a diagram of them, and there's this continuous homeostasis that goes on, um, and especially in a healthy cell where some pieces are, of the, are, are taken back into the cell, re resynthesized, repaired, um, regulation mechanisms for all this, and then you can see little schematics of the, the cross-linking, the AGEs, the, the uh, protein aggregates messing things up. Um, there are some people, um, thank you, Brad, uh, involved in this space. Uh, some of them, one of them even associated with this group, um, uh, Alex Fedensev, um, also Alexei Muskolov, have this kind of thinking where they're calling for an additional hallmark of aging, and somebody should rewrite that paper, by the way. It's been a really long time. It's like 2014. Um, who's going to do that? Um, um, and I don't want like 400 hallmarks of aging. Like, you should try to keep it like some, but still, I would kind of vote for this one. And um, like mTOR seems to be regulated by the ECM, really. Um, cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegeneration, diabetes, osteoarthritis. Um, and they propose some drugs that might do some good um, inhibitors of advanced glycation end products of these types. Um, glucosapine breakers, I think there might be like a, a startup in kind of in our midst working on working at least that stuff. Um, stimulators of elastogenesis. I just love the idea that there's something called rage and like there should be antagonists for it. So you can like rage, rage against the rage um, if you're um, into poetry. Um, so uh, this guy Colin Ewald, I have no idea how to say his name, but it's probably Ewald um, at ETH Zurich who has this coinage called the matriotype. So you imagine if your matrix, that is your extracellular matrix, um, around your cells is degraded in a particular way or affected in some other particular way. Um, you could describe that, sum that up, cut and you know, abstract it and say that is your matriotype. So that's, that's what that word means. Um, and uh, he's really into drug discovery. He's created this whole laboratory of extracellular matrix regeneration there um, and has a bunch of other aging interests. Um, um, all these are links too, so you can just grab this. And it, like one thing that I could possibly, this could possibly be helpful to you is if you are more curious and you just want to grab this and use it as a springboard to maybe you just want to waste four hours and learn about extracellular matrix. This could save you one of them or something. Um, Helen Birch wrote a really nice review as an entire book chapter. She's at ECL London, um, and uh, she points out that there are direct mechanisms linking uh, damage to the. ECM to inflammaging, which is a word we've all heard probably. Uh, so there are these feedback mechanisms and control systems that seem to result in the extracellular matrix becoming more stiff with aging. Um, there are proteins called matrix metalloproteins that are involved, there's a whole bunch of them, dozens, um, that are involved in regulation, of doing chemical reactions of various kinds with the extracellular matrix. Um, that can result in stiffness of the extracellular matrix, um, getting cross-linked and more rigid, which can lead to, among other things, another common phrase, um, a friend in the aging world of cellular senescence. Um, this is a weird one. If you have a rigid, let's, let's say these are two Collagen fibers that aren't getting out of the way, and, and yet cells need to move around a fair bit. They're going to get, they're going to be pushed through anyway. Their nuclei get squeezed and squished in various ways that causes these this 
damage. Various, this is like all these different kinds, kinds of damage that can happen to the nucleus from getting squished, from cells getting squished through rigid ECM. Um, look at all the different kinds of AGEs there are and all the different me uh, regulation mechanisms and, and causes of them. And I'm just kind of amazed that there's actually a thing called dog dick. Um, um, so the, the mechanica, me mechano environment, that's a word, um, affects the circadian clock. Circadian clock is super involved in aging. Um, uh, not sure why, but empirically it seems to be. Um, in this case, we have uh, young mice and old mice, and this is a way of measuring the, the strength of circadian clock in cells from these mice, and you can see it's kind of weak and the old mice and strong and the young mice. And then a, a related experiment on similar cells, if you put them in stiff versus flexible extracellular matrix simulator, um, the ones with the soft extracellular matrix regain their, their um, large amplitude of signaling there. And they've even come up with, well, so there's this protein called rock. Another, there's so many great names. It's almost like Drosophila gene names um, in this space. Um, I know, right? <laughs> um, that they found this this drug called Y27632. I kind of maybe want to eat it. Um, that seems like if you put it on the cells of the old mice, um, their circadian rhythm starts up and gets stronger. Who knows? Read the paper, Yang 2017. Um, so the Evalt lab um, is really into drug discovery and they have this kind of very cast a wide net, think from the top down, uh, like systems kind of thinking for collecting all these different model species, all these different compounds that could affect the extracellular matrix. Um, they're a little obsessed with worms um, and that's okay. Um, but you know they found things that extend worse, worm lifespan. This is cool, the matrosome project. So the matrosome is another one of the coinages in this in this world that means basically it's the proteome of the ECM, um, but it's kind of also interchangeably used to mean like all the genes involved in the ECM, um, of which there are more than a thousand, like five percent of a mammalian genome. Did I get that right? I think that's right. Um, that's a lot. Um, and you can go here to this MIT website and see the matrosome for like half a dozen different um, model species and humans um, and a couple of labs at Chicago and um, Coke and Broad um, are involved in maintaining that. Um, and it's broken down by, they talk about these core matrosome genes that are the ones that actually like code for things that physically go into the extracellular matrix and then there are genes that, around lots of other functions um, you know things that are secreted and affect it things that um, regulate whether it gets broken down or taken up um, et cetera et cetera um, this oh this is cool this is in uh, worms, so it's a smaller number of genes, but uh, they did differentially express genes between young worms and old worms of the matrosome and found like these 150 like specifically aging oriented um, genes in the uh, related to the ECM. Um, I don't know how many of those are human orthologs, but that might be an interesting place to look. If you kind of if you wanted to continue to use a systems biology approach, which I think is a great way to wade into things. Um, speaking of systems biology, um, this is them just looking at, um, uh, they, they, uh, I think they use CMAP um, against all the genes um, in the matrosome and just try to look at things for where things are upregulated and, and downregulated. Um, okay, I don't know how much time I've used it, but I'll leave you with a couple of weird things and maybe a, little, a few questions, which I probably won't be able to answer because uh, did I mention that I'm not an ECM expert, right? Um, so there are ECM-bound nanovesicles. Extracellular vesicles are kind of popular right now, um, but I have never heard of mem specific sp like subsets of them that are, mem that are bound in the extracellular matrix, so that's kind of cool, but they, they were shown to um, contain bioactive molecules that had phenotypic 
effects on cells um, with like microRNAs and typical things that tend to be in extracellular vesicles. So that was interesting. Um, but even weirder, um, the pineal gland, okay, so just in general for bone, um, as just like you know, basic biology 101, there's like bone is made by osteoblasts and it's sort of like recycled or reabsorbed by osteoclasts. Um, it's uh, kind of like anabolic, catabolic, or whatever. They're kind of confusing, but you get used to it. And um, so then there's regulation mechanisms that determine which one's happening more or less, and everything's kept in balance. And melatonin is a big part of that, weirdly. Like, why does how much you sleep affect your bones? I don't know. But back to circadian rhythm, the pineal gland drives the whole thing. That's like your master circadian rhythm driver organ in your brain, like the size of like an uncooked soybean right in the middle of your head. And um, it's, they kind of think they're bone. Um, like the cells in there know how to deposit hydroxyapatite, just like bone does uh, for, you know, for making it makes these little, like, whatever, little osteo something things that are like little rock um, in, your, in your bones. And weirdly, in a young human, there's plenty of pineal gland making your nice, strong melatonin rhythm. In an old human, for some reason, they think they're bone. They keep depositing more hydroxyapatite there, and, and the whole thing can become kind of like a rock in your pineal gland. This is like working a lot less. Um, that's just, that was really disturbing to me and also kind of intriguing and like th those two often go together. Um, and so I just think there's a lot of opportunities around ECM. Um, it's like a whole other branch of biology. Uh, it's a whole other lens that you can look at basically at what's going on in every single cell. And um, I don't have time to go into it and I'm not working at it at my company, but I just encourage other people who look, are looking for something to launch into as a possible thing to survey. Um, and it's, it's weird and cool and I think it matters. So thank you um, for your precious time. Um, thanks Brad for cluing me in on a bunch of these folks. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, that's great. Uh, great topic to bring up because it, it is underappreciated, you know, the whole world that's outside of cells. But there's another whole world within that world that's also underexplored that you probably come across reading these things. Is the extracellular matrix is not just the proteome that's outside the cell, but it's also the glycome, right? Absolutely. And that yeah. glycome is potentially more complex. Hence the proteoglycans and... Yeah, the, so, so yeah. we know which proteins are modified where to a large extent, but how they're modified, those heparin sulfate proteoglycan, uh, heparin sulfate modifications and chondroitin sulfate modifications, a few other classes, they, they're also modified in many different ways. Like yeah, there's 1,027 genes like are secreting like hundreds of different enzymes out there. Like, yeah. Uh, the the code for these modifications are not genetically uh, encoded. Right? There's some randomness to it, but they are functional and they do have specificity. So it's like a whole other world that's unexplored and very difficult to explore, uh, even by mass spec. Right? It's a fairly young field of glycomics analyzing this by mass. I remember. Spec. I remember it but sends. It, it sounds. It doesn't. It's like I appreciate the data. Um, I just wanted to add that. I remember, um, triggered by what you were saying, that it's in 2016, maybe, um, somewhere in Europe, um, Oxford. Um, there was someone talking about AGEs and trying to do something meaningful in AGEs. And like, he just spent years, I forgot his name, um, trying to just even measure them. And like trying to like work with the existing literature that had attempted to measure them and that was making statements about things. And then he was like, oh, he's a chemist at Yale. Um, and who is it? David Spiegel, yeah. Um, um, he, uh, it was just, it was interesting. It was like kind of one of my first kind of wake up calls for biology that like the whole field can be going in a direction that it thinks it's in. And it, it's like wrong once they realize that they're not actually measuring the thing that they're measuring. Um, sort of like 
I think GDF 11 kind of had that issue for a while also. Um, was there a very specific question that you had? Got it, yeah. Also encouraging people to work on the deep complexity and scariness and interestingness of the ECM. Any others? Yeah. yeah. So you looked a little at C. elegans and a little at human stuff. How much conservation is there in the genes, you know, across species that are eating? What is the percentage of orthologs from worms? And cut me off at any time. No, no. Okay. Um, Someone like Kristen would know that, I think, or some, oh, other people. Um, oh, sorry, d d go, go back into your computer, it's okay. <laughs> I was like, what is the, uh, what is the uh, or orthologue overlap between worm and human? See, see all again. Oh God, she was not gonna know that, but just like, in general, the like, the overall like, okay, like, Half of the genes are the same, and another quarter of them are kind of ish similar or something. Yeah, 24,000 20,000 per one. Yeah, gene count is one thing, but then you know they're just doing a lot of different things. Like worms don't really have an immune system; their neurons, like, are linear instead of digital, and like there's like a million things that are different from worms to humans. But a bunch of the things are the same. Like the same with yeast. Uh, th there was yeast on that slide I had before there. Um, time? I know is that the, the persistent HEEs are different across species, but I don't know if that means that the, you know, the genomes that are related to BCM are different, or, or maybe they're somewhat more like the metabolism of BCM. But in Daphne, ACM is exactly the same, it's human. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Irony.